Y'all yeah, back up on our domain, the house of Yehuda. So nobody may not tune in, but at least it'll be uploaded. So um one of the things in our community that I think is very detrimental is I don't think men understand what true masculinity is. I don't think we do. We look at being masculine as being over aggressive, not being compassionate. But what is true masculinity? What makes a man a man? Is it the fact that I can be with a bunch of women? Is it the fact that I can lift or can fight real good? Or what makes a man a man? Yes. Taking care of yourself. Okay. Taking care of yourself. Anybody else? Can successfully follow the commands of God. Is that what make a man? Is following so. Yahweh? You think so? That that's what makes a man. So, so it's not about the size of his lower extremities, then, right? So it's not about that, right? It's not about the fact of, you know, some men feel they got to be tough all the time. Bring them a box of Apple Jacks. I see a tough guy. You ever seen a tough guy eat cereal? He opened the box. Like, why? You game banking on breakfast? You understand? It's, just, it's okay to laugh. It's okay to, to cry. How many of us would have called David a punk if we saw him crying? Anybody? If you know about how David was, how many of us would have been like, David, you a sucker. You gonna let Jonathan kiss on you? That's some bad stuff. You gay. How many of us knowing King David's predi um, his pedigree, knowing how he is, knowing how much of a soldier he is? Obviously, you haven't read about David. Let me tell you something. This is what makes you a man. Turn to the book of 1 Kings. Because obviously, I just want to show this. Because I think sometimes we get stuck on the fact that, you know, what, what makes a man a man? Who <coughs> me says shalom, family. Hey, shalom, shalom. Praise Yahweh. What makes a man a man? In the book of 1 Kings chapter 2, I'm going to read something. This is one of my favorite chapters. Young man come up to me and be like, Brother Michael, not saying they would, but Brother Michael, what does it mean to be a man? Does it is it about the amount of money you have or you, how big your house is or you know how big your car is, you know what I'm saying? What makes a man a man? In the book of 1 Kings chapter 2, it reads, Now the days of David drew nigh, that he should die. <coughs> and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou, be thou strong, therefore, and shew thyself a man. He paused. He told Solomon, I want you to be strong. I want you to be courageous. I want you to be bold. And I also want you to show yourself a man. How do I show myself to be a man? 
Well, let's follow the wisdom that David gave to Solomon. Now, verse 20 and verse 2 of uh, 1 Kings, chapter 2, verse 2, it reads, I go the way, and this is David talking to his son Solomon. I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and shew thyself a man. And keep the charge of Yahweh, thy Elohim, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. <clears throat> keep Yah's charge. That's what makes you a man. Being able to keep Yah's charge is going to help you as a man to do what? To delegate in your house. It's going to help you run your household. Before you go out here to get money, Get Yah. Get Yahweh. Because some people used to be, you know, maybe under depression that serving Yahweh. Oh man, you know, you know, to serve Yahweh, you got to be this destitute bum. But I, most of the all the righteous men that were in the scriptures had money. They're very prosperous. But what made them even more prosperous was that the fact that they knew Yahweh. Job wasn't even an Israelite. He wasn't an Israelite. Neither was Abraham. Neither was Isaac. Israel wasn't started until Jacob. But these were men of righteousness. <clears throat> these were men of righteousness. They were Hebrews, but they weren't Israelites. And these men had one thing in common that made them really masculine. Who knows what that was? Yes, sir. Serving out. That was it. See, build masculinity off of how we walk with Yahweh. Don't build masculinity because society will tell you if we went the way of society, we would never, we would never amount to nothing according to society. Because everything changes. One day, I got on a black shirt. It's in. Everybody, yeah, that's the thing. That tomorrow is red. And then next week is green. See, I'll never amount to nothing if I was to go by society. See, we. that's why to hold on to Yahweh is so important. Because if you really want to be a man, walk with Yah. Because by walking with Yahweh, you're putting your own little <clears throat> me, me's and I, I's to the side. To walk with Yahweh, you got to be a strong man. You can't be a weak, soft, faggot man. You can't do that. I can't say faggot. You can't be a soft man. You got to be strong. And what takes strength is walking with Yahweh. A great example of walking with Yahweh. That's right. Now let's turn to the book of Proverbs. Turn to Proverbs things. It was, it was there earlier, I believe. Proverbs 31. Turn there real quick. And I want to say, forgive me. Uh, never mind. Turn to the book of Proverbs 31. Because I hope that pages get cut off for using the N-word too. Let's be just around the board. In chapter 31, a Proverbs, it says, The words of King Lemuel proceed that his mother taught him. Who was King Lemuel? Who was he? Would 
you believe that was also King Solomon? King Solomon. It's King Solomon. King Lemuel. That was another name. How important is this I'll have to get it and give it to y'all. I'm going to show y'all. But you can look it up. Yeah, you can look it up. Because he had a few names. He was Solomon. Yeah, he had a few names. <clears throat> However, it says the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. He says, what my son and what the son of my womb and what the son of my vow. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. Now, when it says don't give your strength to women, what is that talking about? Um, exactly what it is. Don't be walking around in everybody's cookie yard. Find you a variety of cookies and stick to it. <laughs> I'm trying to keep PC for the children. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> cookie jar. That was bill. dope. Yeah, we get it. We get it. Like the elders say, pocketbook. Don't let everybody in your pocketbook. Uh, <laughs> very good. Those are just some, but you know what that really is dealing with? Your spirit. Because every time you give so much to individuals, you're giving a lot. You're giving so much of you to them. Say, man, he was like, man, don't give your strength to women. Don't give your spirit. Don't give your energy. Not saying to be abusive and mean, but give your energy. Don't, don't, you a king. You held at a certain stature. You don't believe it? What happened to Solomon when he gave his energy to women? He built deities. He built um, um, temple. He allowed these a lot of these strange women that he was married to to have gods, to worship their gods. That's what he did. Some say Solomon stepped out the way and, 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 and just let the women have, have it. He was so... Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. 300 watts and 700 pounds of burns. Yeah. 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 Wait, real dudes in the street be tripping off, too. Right. Right. They do. 300 watts and 700 pounds of burns. It's 365 days in a year, roughly. You get to see one chick per day. That's just in a year. Yeah. Over the course of two years. Yes, if three years you might get around to each one of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. With the exactly. exceptions of the ones that he liked more than others. Yeah, he, he just leave her over there. Yeah. I like her. Yeah. Seriously, yeah, exactly. they probably didn't even get this. Like you said, regularly see him. Like I've heard of Solomon. I'm, I'm married to him, but I. I got this nice house. Yeah, I got this nice house. <laughs> I got this. You know what I'm saying? I got, you know what I'm saying? Fresh lamb chops every day. She's walking so, around the streets talking about I put it on and look what I got. That's right. Oh, that's right. The other wives are looking like you a lot. I, <laughs> I ain't seen him in a year. So I know you ain't seen him. You, you a lie. And the truth ain't in you. But nonetheless, don't give your, a man doesn't give strength out. A man doesn't give that out because that's what we need. We need our strength. And I'm not saying that the woman don't either. But what I'm saying is, is as men, we're held to a certain standard. Or at least we should be held to a certain standard. In our homes, we are the leaders. We're the, we're the uh, disciplinarians. We're the nurturers at times. We carry, we wear a lot of hats. Don't give you strength to men because Yahweh, I mean to women, because Yahweh didn't give us the strength to just give it away. Which leads me to my next question. 
When does, when it comes to family, did you check that, sis? Let me well. When it comes to families, when does loyalty have a cap on it? Meaning, like, when does loyalty stop when it comes to family? When you start to, when you, when you start to um, go behind people's back and say something that uh, <clears throat> they told you, when you started running your mouth to somebody else, when you tell them, what Okay, we'll go with that. My question is, when it comes to loyalty, now we know what loyalty is, right? What being loyal is. When does loyalty have a cap? When do you say, you family, but I'm going to have to leave you alone? When does that take place? When should it take place? I'm asking because a lot of times, People will say, yeah, that's my that's my sister or that's my this or that, my family member, and I got to stick by it. Even though they're bringing everybody else down, but you stick by them just because they're family. Or he's been a really good friend to me, <coughs> excuse me, to me. So I can't just leave him like that. When does loyalty have a capital? That's my question. When does it have a cap? I'll tell you when. When it's getting in the way of serving the Almighty. I love you from a distance, brother. Oh, I love you from a distance, son, sister, but you get in the way of my peace. <clears throat> and Yah is my peace. We can't control, we can't control nothing outside. But I can control what's in my house. So my loyalty stops when my father and his ways are in comp are being compromised. Any comments on that? Okay, very good. Now, I have a couple weeks ago, we weren't able to say anything last week because we weren't on YouTube because I know majority of the people that we have watches us on, watches us on YouTube. And I apologize, but a couple weeks ago, a question was asked about where did the Almighty say he would destroy the earth with fire? I have that. Also, we talked about the flood. We talked about some of the things that the Almighty was very distinctive on what he wanted to destroy. So first, let me start with the fire. In scriptures, where does Yahweh talk about using fire as a destructive tool or as a tool that he, that he would destroy the earth with? Well, there's a couple places I want to look at. Turn to the book of Zephaniah first. Hmm. In the book of Zephaniah, Go to the first verse, first chapter, excuse me.
I'm only going to read a few verses where it mentions fire. In Zephaniah 1, in verse 18, it reads, well, start, I'm going to start at verse 15. I'm going to start at verse 14. Excuse me. So Zephaniah 1 and 14, it reads, The great day of Yahweh is near. It is near and hastens greatly, even the voice of the day of Yahweh. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble, a day of distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick cloud and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men, <clears throat> because they have sinned against Yahweh, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of Yah's wrath. So Yahweh on the day of Yah's wrath, he's letting the world know. He's letting them know that I don't care how much money you got. I don't care how much gold you got. I don't care about none of that. It's not going to deliver you when I'm coming for you. See, we serve an Elohim that can't be bought off. We serve an Elohim that can't be bribed. Hold this and hold Zephaniah and turn to the book of Psalms, chapter 50 for a moment. In the book of Psalms, chapter 50, let's look at the 21st verse. It reads, these things hast thou done, and prior up is talking about the atrocities and evil workings we've done to our brethren, to our sister, and just the wickedness we've done. It said, these, these things hast thou done, in the book of Psalms 50 and 21, it says, these things hast thou done, and I kept silent. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as thyself. The purpose for that particular verse there is that's because that's how we treat the Most High God. We treat him, and it's, and it's, it's sad to say, that we treat the Almighty like he can be uh, bribed, like he can be lied to. We treat the Almighty like even how we come at the Almighty. I think it's important that whenever you're talking to the Almighty, to, to Yahweh, you should watch how you speak. What I mean by that is, let me throw this out there. What do y'all think about this? I pray to the Almighty and I come at him like, yo, yo, Elohim, let me ask you. Um, hey, yo, I got this issue. I, hey, yo, can I, yeah, can you? You feel me, y'all? You feel me? Do you think Yahweh appreciates me talking to him that way? But here's the thing. Does he appreciate that? And I say that because I take that same person because I've seen it. I'm talking about ghetto. White man called Yes, this is this is Raheem. Yes, 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 yes. This is Raheem. Yes, they might have a little twang in their voice, but it switches up. I work in customer service, so I've heard individuals who normally speak. They be like, "Yo, this," and as soon as a call comes through, "Yes, hello, hi, my name is my my name is Cool. Um, how can I help you today?" And it's been times I'll be like. Now, that ain't Kool-Aid who was talking to us in the break room, boy. This is a different Kool-Aid. And I say that because 
we watch how we talk to one another, but we don't necessarily watch how we communicate to the Almighty. What y'all think? Okay, now I'm opening up. What's y'all think? Okay. I'm not talking about a case of code switching. <laughs> I'm talking about an individual who can only express himself in that manner, then I would say, then that is his self. That's all he has to present to the most high. Okay. But certainly, if you had the capacity to switch it up, I would recommend you switch it up and be respectful. Gotcha. Very good. Anybody else? I'm in total agreement. That if you can practice how we talk to the Almighty, practice it. Address the Almighty as though He's important in your life. Am I wrong? Am I the only one in the room? The other two classes, y'all was running your mouth. Now everybody in here quiet now. Look, I'm the last one in here. Y'all need to be hyped because I can't be up here like, yeah. You going to sleep in your own lesson. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, y'all was all, yeah, 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 yeah. Now everybody want to be quiet. What y'all, fool? Go ahead. What was you going to say? Oh, now your lips tight. Oh, you know what? I'm through with you. I don't know where you going in your life. No, I'm teasing. But yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead, sweetheart. I didn't, I'm sorry. I, I no, you're didn't fine. think that you asked the question. I thought you were making a statement. Yeah, I asked the question. So you, you said I'm in total agreement, and then you I said, then I said, what do y'all think? We'll get some more comments. Oh, I agree with you. We went all around the bush for you to say that. And see, you can't please. People because now, first, I, ain't, I ain't letting you please me. First you, first, you said nobody was talking, now somebody's talking, now you don't like what they say. It's not that I don't like what they say. You you want to be argumentative? I, I don't so, think so. Sister, 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 I was deceived. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Right, you can't take a. But no, I totally agree with the fact that. See, I asked that question because I want to see where, where we at and what, what you guys think. But I totally agree. If and you brought when you brought out that point, it depends on how you were raised and how you were taught to talk. You might only know street talk, but however, but even if, let me say this: even in knowing street talk, even those who speak what they consider to be street talk, when they come up to someone they respect, they flip it. Or when they go to court. Exactly. Okay, Raheem Tephilius, what do you have to say? Well, judge, I'm just, you know, and it flips it. I'm just. I don't think that's in all cases, though. Okay. I think that, you know, you give what you got. That's it. You give what you got. You give what you got. Very good. Yes, sir. Uh, do you know, uh, some um, some people that like they just use difficult words to try to vote themselves. Sure, I know people like that. Yeah, go ahead. No, yes. like no, like they'll like say like difficult words, like uh, say for example, a simple sentence. I walked in the park. I could triple climb or something uh, to the park. I, they say some difficult word. Yeah, and then they. Yeah, it yeah, yeah, I do. But the the uh, the thing is, we should really watch how we come at the Almighty, even in prayer. We should really watch it because the Almighty is very important. The same energy we will put into impressing someone that we might want to date or impressing some someone that we might want to give us a job. We should put that same energy times 10 in how we present ourselves to the creator. You know what I mean? I think we should, that's something that, you know, I think 
that should take place. Show the world that the Almighty means a lot to us. You know, in the book of jo in the book of Joshua, it talks about in the second chapter is dealing with the fact of that he was sending out he sent out these um, um, uh, these uh, spies to go spy out Jericho, and the people of Jericho feared Israel. They feared Israel. Why did they fear Israel? Because Yahweh was working a work for them. When we went to battle, very rarely did we have to, the Almighty was like, he'll be like, I did this, now you go finish up. They came with 10,000. I done knocked out a good six or 7,000, now y'all gonna finish. <clears throat> And nations heard about Yahweh and how he was with Israel. So they feared Israel. And I thought about it like, man, we've lost that because of how we treat the Almighty and we as servants. So there's etiquette classes for other things. There should be an etiquette class for that. I think so. On how we communicate with the Creator. Because you said it one time, says too, like you got to watch what you say. Especially when you're speaking to the Almighty, you have to watch what you say. You understand? So it should be an etiquette class on how we should how we should approach the Almighty. You understand? The one thing that I like about... Um, and I'm not saying you'd be able to do this in all cases, but one thing I liked was the fact of how when the Muslims pray, they wash their hands and face. Whatever reason, that's what they cleanse. They clean all the way up to their elbows. They just they use water and they wash their face and then they go and pray. They use a, a rug to separate and the prayer rug doesn't have anything to do with the deity. But they use it to separate themselves from the ground. From they look at it as dirt. Like even when you're dealing with um, cleanliness. Cleanliness. I think that we all should have our houses. Uh, if it ain't if it's your house, your business, your car, whatever, treat it as though the Almighty is driving and sitting right next to you. Am I making sense? Does that make sense? Treat it as though Yahweh is sitting right next to you. You get done eating your sandwich, don't just throw the trash down. Pick it up, throw it in the garbage if you can. Get a garbage bag and put it in there. Keep your house clean. <clears throat> Always prepare your, keep yourself clean. Take a shower, take a bath. Wash yourself. Put on clean clothes. Be clean. You got a room and you living with somebody, keep your room clean. Act as though the Almighty is coming to visit. Is that too far-fetched? Keep yourself tight. At least show the Almighty that I appreciate you, y'all. Nobody's saying you got to go out and spend millions of dollars. But what I am saying is keep the things that you do have, keep them in order. Don't clutter yourself with a whole bunch of not unnecessary things. Whether it's your house or your thoughts. Because I'm going to tell you, I didn't think about this with you, but Excuse me, when it comes to cluttered thoughts, sometimes you got to look at your space. Is my space cluttered? Is that taken away from me? Do I need to clean some things up? Do I need to get rid of some things? Bathe yourself. Cleanse yourself. Act as though the Almighty is walking right next to you. 
I know my wife sometimes she gets she she might laugh or I might be irritating, but I'm very meticulous about my clothes, about my space, about my about my car. Very meticulous. But then one day I had to think like, man, yeah, keep these things as though the Almighty is right next to me. Love the Almighty that much. Keep your nails clean. You understand? Anybody see something different? Anybody want to chime in on that? It has to start with your thoughts. It has to be a mindset. Exactly, sweetie. You got to start here. You're absolutely right. Clean your thoughts. First, clean your thoughts. But don't wait to clean your thoughts before you wash your tail, though. You, you, I think you can do both. But you want to you wanna have a clean, just clean, as clean as possible. We're in this land of total filth. Everything is filth. It's trifling. The air is trifling. This grant that is just trifling. But be as clean as possible. Act as though the Almighty is walking right next to you. Yes, sir. Yeah, like um, sometimes somebody can like say something. They say like they just come to their mind and they say it, and they say it, and somebody else might get offended, but that person don't realize what's. They don't realize they are offended people. So mm -hmm. then an hour or two later, they start to think about it. And they come up with me. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I'm going to use that example, not just in physical cleanliness, but how we talk, how we deal with day to day. I'm a cusser. I am. I cuss. And it's a horrible, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible flaw that I have. And I have to work on that because I represent the Almighty. I can't come in there with beer growing in, kufis, and wearing sometimes I wear my robes to work and I come in there and I'm in there like, yeah, man, these bees be like, man, come on, man. It don't even match. You got a problem with words? Read the dictionary. I'm, I'm starting to, I started reading the dictionary. I ain't started doing that till I got with my wife because I wanted to know what she was talking about. When I started reading the dictionary, and I'm, you know what I'm saying, just, just open and broaden yourself. Practice shutting up. Practice it. Practice not having to speak unless you got something real to say. Work on that. Work on patience. Yeah. Going for work on your diet. Get junk out your diet. You don't need barbecue grippos every day. There's fruit out there. There's things out there that's healthy. Get the body together because you align with the Almighty. You you because in order to be in aligned with it, because I've seen that little that little chakra thing, that little diagram, that little thing they have. Because the lotus plant is the middle part, right? They got this little lotus plant. And they like and they use the, the lotus plant because of how it grows, like you brought out. It's a loose rain mud. Yeah. Yeah. And how it grows it's a beautiful plant that can grow in the muck. But it's a beautiful plant. So that's a symbol for a lot of meditation things, a lot of the lotus plant. So yeah. Clean your diet up, clean yourself up, clean your space. Yeah. Yeah. But getting back to this, the book of Zephaniah, chapter 1 and 18, it said, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of Yahweh's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by what? By fire of his jealousy. Now, when I looked at the fire, the fire of his jealousy, 
Now, is this just a metaphor or is this actually what his jealousy looks like? It's a consuming fire. So right here it says, that's what he's going to use is to do the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance, riddance of all that dwell in the land. And this test, this is something here where the almighty is sending this, the fire of his jealousy. Even his jealousy is consuming. And Yahweh got every right to be jealous. You understand? I'm going to throw a proclamation out there for those that may be watching. Whenever, when it comes to the Almighty and his jealousy, it is very destructive. Very destructive. Unmercifully, at times, destructive. His jealousy. Let's look at another place. Let's go to where we went earlier. We was in Nahum. Turn to the book of Nahum, please. Sure. Nahum chapter three. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Scripture that you just Scripture to identify what exactly? Fire. Fire. Jealousy. Fire. fire consuming. Because right now I'm just showing where the fire, how destructive no. his jealousy can be. But I'm talking about, are you saying that's a scripture that the Almighty is being used to say that the world would be destroyed? Oh, no. This okay. is dealing with the fire. Okay. Just dealing with fire. Just dealing with fire but, right now. I got a scripture for the world, but I'm just going okay, through some scriptures. I'm trying to determine exactly what you were saying about the fire in this particular scripture. Yeah, I was talking about the fire of his jealousy. I'm talking about jealousy, yeah. his jealousy, fire of his jealousy. Turn to the book of Nahum, chapter 3. In the book of Nahum, chapter 3, let me look at the verse. Okay, good, good. Start at verse 13. It says, Behold, thy people in the midst of thee are women. The gates of thy land shall be set wide open unto thine enemies. The fire shall devour thy bars. Draw, through, draw thee waters for the siege. Fortify thy strongholds, go into clay and tread the mortar, make strong the brick, the brickling. There shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off, it shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Make thyself many as the canker worm, make thyself many as the locust. Now, let me say this, the, the reason that I'm reading these scriptures is just, is just I'm just basically just showing how how fire is so how, how destructive it can be. And then I'll lead up to the other scripture, to the actual scripture I want to use. But just showing that this, this could you just imagine? Number one, being in the way of Yahweh's jealousy. Fire is very very destructive. Fire can spread like that, and all it takes is a spark. The only way to really fight a fire is to suffocate it, depending on the fire. Suffocate it. Take the oxygen away from it. But fires can be easily spread and easily fueled. If you've ever seen a house if you've ever watched on television and you've seen where the fire might have started in the kitchen and by the end of the of, of that particular scene, it's done destroyed the whole house. That's how destructive it is. Yahweh said he was going to use that 
to basically destroy destroy the inhabitants in the world. Because Yahweh said that the world won't be shaken. The world is going to stay forever. But it's the inhabitants, the inhabitants of it. The Almighty is going to destroy us. Or destroy the wicked, I should say. Let's go to the book of Hosea. And then we'll go to the scripture that I definitely want um, that we will uh, go to. In the book of Hosea, chapter 8, and I'm just going to read one verse. Hosea, chapter 8. In the book of Hosea, chapter 8, and verse 14, it reads, For Israel hath forgotten his maker, and built the temples, and Yehuda had multiplied fenced cities. But I will send a fire upon his cities, and shall devour the palaces thereof. Again, I'm just showing the, the fire, where Yahweh used fire. Now, these are, this isn't dealing with the world. It's dealing with certain areas and certain time frames. But there is one that's dealing with the destruction using fire. And that's in the book of, turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66. In the book of Isaiah chapter 66, I'm going to start reading at the 15th verse. And I'm only going to read 15, 16, and 17. In the book of Isaiah 66 and 15, it says, For behold, Yahweh will come with fire. And with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. He's coming back with fire. This destructive. Destructive, powerful force he's coming with. He's going to destroy things. And it says for by fire. And by his sword will Yahweh plead with all flesh. Now, when it talks about pleading, this ain't talking about begging. No. This is how he's going to communicate with all flesh. With fire, with the sword. And the slain of Yahweh shall be many. They that sanctified themselves and purified themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the mists, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith Yahweh. Any questions? Any comments? Isaiah 66 is the strongest scripture. But Isaiah 66 verses 15 to 17. She asked about showing where he would use fire. You can just um, tell 
how much in control he is because I was thinking about the brothers that were put in the fiery furnace. Mm -hmm. The Almighty controlled that as well, you know? Yeah. And when they came out that fiery furnace, they didn't even smell like fire. They didn't even smell like smoke. Their clothes weren't singed. And when the king looked in, he said, man, I thought we took and put three in there. Why is there four? And one of them looked like the son of Elohim. Now, one thing, too. Um, in dealing with the flood, I'm just answering questions. In dealing with the flood, the Almighty, um, as it was stated, was absolutely, you guys are absolutely right. All he wanted to, all he mentioned destroying was man, the beasts, the ones that weren't on the ark, and the and the and the fowl, the birds. And you can read about that in. Genesis chapter seven or chapter six and seven. I had to read them. So read Genesis six and chap chapter six and chapter seven. Now, this is for some. I want to go over this real quick, too. This is kind of just doing a recap of some things. But in dealing with the sons of Elohim, some believe that the sons don't believe that the sons of Elohim were angels. They don't believe that the sons of Elohim were angels. In some ways, <laughs> turn to the book of Genesis chapter 6. So, mm -hmm. I think, um, okay, when it said, uh, when we create man in our image, we want to, that was the angel. Uh -huh. okay. Excuse me. Yep. That was, those were angels. Some people would say that was Christ that he was talking to. But of course it wasn't. It wasn't. It was the angels. Now check this out. In Genesis chapter 6, starting at the first verse, it reads, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, some will feel like, well, hey, the sons of Elohim weren't angels, but they were angels. What scripture can I use to show this fact? Turn to the book of Job real quick. Chapter one, book of Job. And then once I get through these, I'll open up for any, any questions anybody may have or comments. In the book of Job, chapter one, I am going to read in verse number, Shalom, Shalom. I am going to read in verse number six. I'm going to start at verse six in Job chapter one. On who were these sons of Elohim? And there are some that wouldn't believe that they were angels. They were angels. They were called, you know, they were Malachs, they were the sons of Elohim. And it says, now there was a day when the sons of Elohim came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan came also among them. These are talking about angels. Does anyone see different? All right, let's go one more place. Let's look at, let's go to the second chapter. 
The first verse it reads, in the book of Job chapter 2 it reads, Again, there was a day when the sons of Elohim came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan came also among them to present himself before Yahweh. So when the scriptures are mentioning, in this case here, the sons of Elohim, they're talking about the angels. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Wouldn't you would like to know what would be in our land during Isaiah 66, 15, Will we be in our land? No. We will not be in our land yet. We will be on our way there? I would say so. We won't be we won't be at home yet. And as a matter of fact, when we do leave America, it won't be under the pretense of we leave here and go straight into the land. We're going to fight. We're going to fight Gog and Magog before we even step foot into the land. We're going to go through some more. The Almighty is going to do a mass purging. He's going to do a mass purging. Are there any other questions or comments? All right. So, turn to the book of Isaiah 29. And for the time that I have, I'll just answer questions. I really didn't. Um, I'll just answer questions if there are any questions. In the book of Isaiah chapter 29, and let's look at the 13th verse. It says in Isaiah 29 and 13, Wherefore, Yahweh said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. What does that verse say to you before I explain what I think it says? Well, not what I think it says, but what it says. What do you? What do y'all think? Yes, ma'am. Praise Yahweh. Shalom, shalom, everybody that's tuning in. Praise Yah. Hallelujah. So, in the book of Isaiah, uh, twenty-nine and thirteen. When it talks about the fear of Yahweh is taught by the precepts of men, how would you explain that? Yes, ma'am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. People don't fear Yahweh in the essence of Yahweh. We serve a terrible, terrible element. But he's also kind and compassion. He doesn't punish us right away for the dirt that we do. And I think a lot of times we play Yahweh crazy on account of that. Mm -hmm. And then when he finally catches up to us, oh Yahweh, I'm so sorry. We're well, forgiving. We beg and we plead for his mercy and we act so sincerely apologetic. But up until that point, like he committed that sin 25 to 50 times over without any true regard based on the teachings that Yahweh is loving and compassionate. And he is those things. It's also very terrible. But he's wiped out the entire civilization. It's never to be started again, heard of again. Right. But we'll take the things that men say about Yahweh. We'll take that to heart instead of worshiping Yahweh in his true, terrible, loving essence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn to the book of 1 Samuel 15. Yes, sir. Eventually, they just look at the 
past that special Oh, yeah. oh, you're asking me? Um, not necessarily, because if you, well, let me leave you this. What do you consider the best? So most people, they would say, um, talk about the uh, stone and people in there. That side of uh, Yahweh. Well, if you truly feared that side of Yahweh, you were of us would sin. Because we would know that something bad would be happening from what we're doing. But since we aren't getting stoned anymore, what's going to keep you from committing adultery or saying another deity's name or any of the commandments that can be broken? What's to stop? That's a, good point, sis. That's a good point. True fear of Yahweh will stop you from doing that. Not just an actual physical consequence. Yeah. Yes, sir. The last verse that you read? It was, yes, it was Isaiah 29 and 13. Let me turn back there. It read. Wherefore Yahweh said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. I want to go back to that says Yahweh. Yeah, the response to that is that can be looked at in few different ways, even more so than a few different ways. Just an example. Now, for your term, the coin, two books. Mm -hmm. I've personally spoken to people who claim to be Israel, who claim to worship the Creator, but are far removed because they're giving all of the glory to the Christ of the New Testament. Completely removed themselves from that. Couldn't be farther from that. But we'll swear that they're they're right. You know, and the Almighty not really saying, first of all, they don't give his glory to anybody else. And if, surely if he had, if you had a book written this way, and you wanted someone to serve yourself, mm -hmm. surely you would mention his name at least one time along the way of telling them to serve exactly. yourself. That's right, that's right. So when they don't even have that evidence, but they want to justify wickedness and say they're servants of the Almighty, but calling and praising someone other than the Creator. I would say that's far removed, but that's just one of them. Praise God. Praise God. And as and as you were speaking, something hit me. How many of us in here have fears? And I'm not talking about. The, the most high. I, I know that. I'm talking about how many of us in here have fears? If you want to, mention one of your fears. Just my Okay. Anybody else want to share a fear? Water. Water. Mass water flowing over bridge, fire to death, two lane highway over mm -hmm. long bridge, yeah. on rails and whatnot. Vision not being good and just. Uh, a lot of a lot of different things, but basically I say height and water height. add it together. Good point. Height and water. Yeah. Well, that's good. I'm scared of heights. Heights. What about you, sis? I'm talking about the height compared mm -hmm. with the water. Right, right, height right. Over the water. I feel you because one time I walked over this the bridge that connects Kentucky. To Cincinnati one time, and I almost was willing to walk in the street. It's just, you know, I feel you. Any 
Seriously, I mean, mine is water and heights. That's one of my big things. One of my big things is water and heights. Now, the purpose for me asking that is the things that we fear, we do our best to avoid, right? So if there's a way for me to go around the where I don't have to cross a bridge or cross water, I find that route. It might take me a little longer to get to where I'm going, even though all I can do, all I need to do is go across this bridge. But because of my ap apprehension or my fear of heights or water, I'll, I might find an alternate route. But my biggest thing is really, well, both of them are. But like when I go to Kings, I'm gonna use when I go to Kings Island, I'm the one that holds the lunches. I sit on the bench. Y'all want to get on drop zone, go right ahead. I'll go in the gift shop and I'll do that. Y'all can get on that. I'll get on the water ride. I got on two, I'm gonna tell you, I got on two, no, three roller coasters since I had ever been. I haven't been to Kings Island in years. One of them was the was the Raptor, the Nickelodeon. When I got on it with this with a, with this uh, child I was with, well, that was a child's ride. My legs were too long for the ride. As I'm going, this ride is fast. My feet are. All it took was for one foot to get caught in the tracks. I would not have been here at all. I'd have been a mess. I don't. There are things that I avoid. Because of my fear of it, I don't fear it necessarily. Have a, but I don't like spiders. That's me. I don't like spiders. They irritate me because if we have flies, you ain't eating the other bugs, but you're going to crawl down and want to get in my. No. But I have that. So I do things to avoid spiders. You understand? If one is on the, in the corner of my house, I go over to it. I say, well, as long as you stay right there, you can have free room and board. You know what I'm saying? Don't bring no other spider freaks in here. And y'all be in the corner making babies. We ain't having that because then you got to go. But nonetheless, I have a fear of talking to someone and my breath stinks. So I take precautions on certain things. But here's, here's the point of me saying this. The things that we have fear about are things that we avoid. That's how you show you truly have a fear for it. But we don't show that same fear to the Almighty, but we'll say we fear him, but we still don't do things to avoid his wrath. Most of us will have more fear of going up to the Eiffel Tower than doing something that'll cause the Almighty to be angry with us. Sometimes we, sometimes if we measure that, like for example, and I'm coming to you, Elder, like for example, young man, young men, we get a little, you know, we young, so we get the, the earth, if you know what I mean. And you're raised up, huh? Yeah, we want some cookies. Chocolate chip cookies, sugar cookies, peanut butter cookies. We want the cookies. So we know Yahweh said, do not touch the cookie before you get married. Right? Before you get married, don't you mess with that. Unless you're going to make her a wife, don't mess with her until you get married. And in our mind, we'll be like, man, I fear the Almighty. Until it comes to that. So now you got this woman coming into the Bible class or coming into wherever she at with 50 children and no husband, but you her boyfriend. Knowing the Almighty don't play that. But we'll say, I fear Yahweh, but yet do the things that cause him to be angry with us. But I fear him. That's talking with a fourth tongue. 
I fear Yahweh, but I'm going to do things that's going to cause me to get in bed with the one that I supposedly fear. You know, it's deep that if we were to walk through so-called bad neighborhoods, the hot spots, you walk through bad neighborhoods and you see a group of people that look just like you, but they might be smoking weed, shooting dice, selling dope. But because of your apprehension, what you're going to do, you're not going to walk. You're not going to cross through their dice game and kick their money out the way. You ain't going to do that. You're going to do what? You see them? I think I'll go over here. And this is out your way. Why? Because of your apprehension that these guys that you have, that these guys going to get up, they're going to shoot me in my head, it's going to hurt, I'm going to cry a little bit and bleed and die, and I ain't ready for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to avoid them altogether and walk this way. But Yahweh say, man, I'm coming with fire. Man, I'm coming with vengeance. Man, I'm coming with hell and brimstone. Man, I'm coming with a, a sweltering wind to destroy you or to destroy anyone that crosses me. But you got more fear over this little eight-legged creature than you do with me. Then I created that creature, homie. I created that. Matter of fact, fool, I gave you dominion over that creature. And you fear it? But you don't fear me. But yeah, you say you fear me. What are you doing? But everything that we truly fear, most of us fear the police more than we do the Almighty. How can I tell? How you know? Let's say you're driving through a neighborhood and the speed limit is 25. You're going to do your darndest to drive 25. Or you might be fake hard, them studio gangsters, and be like, man, I'm doing, I'm doing 30. I'm going to do 30. I'm going to do 40. But as soon as you see a police car, what happens? You slow down until you get to that 25, don't you? Because of that police car. Some people even turn down the music. As soon as they see that police car. But when you get past the police car, you might throw up the finger and be like, got him. And then you hit 50 in a 30 and a 25 mile zone. But why that police, why you was right there in the viewpoint of that police officer, you slow down, might even put your weed down and drove like you had some sense. But when it comes to the Almighty who watches us every day, he watches us every day. When it comes to the Most High Yahweh, you know what we do? We don't stop what we want to indulge in. Elder Yemuel, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. I just hadn't considered. When I say high bridges over water, I think that's because it's been time that my eyes are not what they used to be. And I think that I fear that I might mess up or something like that. But when it comes to just being high, I mean, I'm not afraid to be on a plane and flying high above water. But See, when I don't yeah. have, no, I wasn't when, saying when, it. When, I, no, I didn't. I didn't. I don't. I didn't look at it like that. I didn't no, look no. at it like that. Like, like what I'm trying to say. There, there are fears, and it's it's nothing wrong with being afraid of something. Like I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying, but when I but what I really want to pull out is the fact of what the fear was, and that's what that's what I'm was pulling out was that like you don't have to explain that you're not afraid of that. Like I understand that, but I'm, I'm just myself that I yes, sir. Because I was considering 
what the question was. Mm -hmm. If I was afraid of just afraid of afraid, then I would leave it alone. I'm afraid of myself in a situation like that. That's like I, when I give examples like a two lane situation on a high bridge or something. Right, right. My mm -hmm. eyes are not, and I'm more afraid when I have my family with me. Because if something's not quite right with me and I go, I don't want to be in an accident or something like that. Just this like, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you drive, you might have somebody in the front seat that you care about. Mm -hmm. And you find yourself getting ready or you're getting ready to be in an accident or whatever, you put your arm out trying to protect the other person over there. So when I say I'm afraid of high places, like let me go over a little whatever and over why it's quite different. Visualize that drop and what you what I've done or something like that. That's more frightening to me than being in a plane above the clouds going over water. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I was just trying to clarify my thought. Because what I said, I wanted to be clear in what I said, and I didn't think that I was clear. So I wanted to clear it up that way. You're on the Sabbath day. I'm saying what I really mean. Mm. I, and I apologize for interrupting because I did. That was very rude. But I'm here to tell you, I'm not Superman. I'm afraid. I'm not Superman. I I go things that's high. I'm like this. That's me. Glasses and no glasses. I'm just being honest. But that's something that I avoid because I fear it. But when it comes to Yahweh, there were things that we should avoid, but we don't. And then I say, I fear the creator. Like with a fourth tongue is how we speak sometimes. Like, I was thinking this week about some things. And the one thing that I want to do is the one thing that I was meditating on was the fact that how on how we are when it comes to the most high. And how we have a love for the creator. But we want to treat him like we would treat a side chick like Yahweh is a lot of our side chicks. We don't want to make a main relationship with the Almighty. We want to keep him on the side because there are certain attributes that he offers that we don't want to give up. But our main chick is wickedness. And that's who we like to be up under. You dig what I'm saying? And I'm and, and when I when I asked the question about the fears, it was for us to really sit back and think about it. Like, man, if there's something I'm fearing. Even if it's not a fear of like, ooh, you still do things to avoid it. So I'm going to avoid this thing because it worries me. I allow it to worry me. But when it comes to the Almighty, I'm just going to kind of, it is what it is. And then we'll use the term, Yahweh understands my heart. And that's what we do. That's what we do. We play more to the tangibility of things than we do to our spirituality. Um, when we can't see some things directly in front of us, you know, then we're out of sight, out of mind sometimes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we feel like we got this safety net with the Almighty, like, I mess up. I can repent from it, I can do this, because he's not directly in our face. But if he were a physical entity in our face, like maybe our fathers at home, some children are afraid of disappointing mm -hmm. their fathers, their parents and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it helps them to straighten up because they know what they're walking into face once they get home, but then you know, if our spirituality isn't aligned with the Almighty and we don't have Yah at the forefront, mm -hmm. then we're going to keep 
acting like that because he's not tangible because we can't see him. We can't pick up the bell and whoop our butt, so we think. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, that's what tangibility, we get all caught up in sight mm -hmm. not sight. That's right. Good point. Good point. Yes, ma'am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My viewpoint is a bit different because I wholeheartedly believe so y'all can do whatever you want. Like we do stuff and we feel like maybe we got away with it because like you didn't die. Right, right. But what happens when like your spirit decided the most high now suddenly you having problems at your job. You're not getting along with people. It's your place of business. Good point. You go into the grocery store and consistently you can't find the things that you need for the things that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Anything that could be considered a problem or ill in your life could be as a repercussion of breaking one of Yahweh's laws today, yesterday, nine years ago, whatever. I don't know what Yahweh's time frame, but discipline is. Right. I'm just saying. Right. Like, it's things that happen to us, and we just kind of attribute it to it's just the stuff of life. It may actually be like real punishment for the thing, for our iniquity. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to be this person. That's a great point, sis. Praise our way. Turn to the book of 1 Samuel. This will be the last scripture. I'll probably take a little extra time. It's a little extra time. Um, is it questions? All right. Um, turn to the book of First Samuel, chapter fifteen. No, I wanted to read the whole chapter, but I'm not. I'm gonna answer questions in the comments there. In the book of First Samuel, chapter fifteen, I'm gonna start at the fifteenth verse. Now. Uh, you can read the whole chapter, but of course, a lot of us are familiar with this chapter. Saul was Saul was sent out to to do a certain mission. He was sent to destroy the Amalekites. Everything, beautiful, ugly, crooked, straight, fat, skinny, destroy everything. Hell, if they was in there making biscuits. Set everything on fire, destroy everything, don't take nothing with you, right? He was sent in there to do that. But Saul did the opposite. Saul saved the best of the, of the livestock, didn't he? And then blamed his soldiers and said, well, you know, the people, uh, you know, they say, uh, you know, I had to, uh, they, they, they were going to they were gonna beat them. Uh, they were going to get me if I didn't. Saul, you are you about to be a you a king. You about to be a ruler over a nation. You were given a job to do. Check this out. I'm gonna start reading at verse fifteen. No, <laughs> let me start at verse twelve. No, eleven. No, ten. In 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 10, it says, Then came the word of Yahweh unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. Repent means it, 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 he, he, it made him feel, man, what did I do? Man, I'm angry that I had to set him up as king. For he is turned back from following me and have not performed my commandments. And he grieved Samuel, and he cried unto Yahweh all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was Samuel saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and is gone about, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou, Yahweh. I have performed the commandment of Yahweh. Let me ask this question. Yahweh 
how does Yahweh feel? I'm gonna ask this question. It's a little off topic with this, but that's normal for me. What if I get a tattoo of the commandments? To always stay reminded of the commandments. Could I then say that I'm that I fear Yahweh? That I am honoring Yahweh by getting this tattoo of the commandments on me? How do I honor Yahweh? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See? 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 How about I show I love Yahweh by not getting a tattoo? How about that? How about I don't mark on my flesh as he told me not to do? But we pull a saw. But look, I got the commandments on my back. How you gonna read them, fool? <laughs> First commandment. Thou shalt have no other thing before Yahweh. Second commandment. Oh, that one you messed up on. You understand? How you, how you, you and we're doing it justified to say, but this is this is me loving Yahweh. This is me loving the creator. So you show your love for Yahweh by being disobedient to him. My wife hates coconuts, coconut stuff. Let's say it's my wife's birthday. I go to the bakery and I say, give me a double layer coconut cake because it's pretty. And I bring it in and say, I love you. Is that me showing that I love you by giving you something that you detest? That's like bringing a dog into the temple to be sacrificed as a free will offering to the Almighty. And then we got the audacity to be angry with Yahweh. Like, who? Cain. You, you, you don't want mine? My, my, you don't want this? Man, I'm giving you the best. No, you're not giving me the best. Even if you are giving me something without a blemish, your spirit ain't right with it. You ain't giving it to me without feeling any type of doubt or disbelief. So what Saul did was he assumed that, hey, I am going to take the best. Even though Yahweh said, you said retarded earlier. Even though, even though Yahweh said destroy everything. The retarded mind, the undeveloped mind goes, hey, I know Yahweh said that we should destroy everything, but I'm not going to destroy everything. I'm going to save the best of the best of the best. And Saul came up because the Almighty came to Saul, I mean Samuel, and Samuel goes and meets Saul. And this is what happens. And Samuel says, what mean thee, what mean then this bleeding of sheep in mine ear? It says, listen, you're supposed to destroy everything. Why am I hearing these sheep? Why am I hearing them bleed? Why, why, what is this? You should have brought nothing back but you and the soldiers. But you bring back the best. Yeah, I, I brought back the best of the best. Let's finish reading. He says, and Saul said, this was Saul's answer. And Saul said, they have brought, they, they, they couldn't have brought nothing back if it wasn't okay by your command. You were the commander in chief. You, I was going to make, I'm making, you were going to be made, you're made into a king. They can't move unless you tell them to move. So it wasn't that they brought them without your knowledge. You knew it. You didn't think to say, hey, guys, destroy them. No. What did you do? Because you had to ride on the horse. Your soldiers was marching. And you didn't notice them sheep behind them. Ah, ah. You didn't notice that song. You couldn't have stopped and said, no, we ain't taking them back with us. Set them on fire. Cut their heads off. Do whatever. Destroy him. Y'all said destroy him. No, you didn't do that. You did. So you're just so you're just as guilty. And then it says here, and Saul said, 
they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of oxen to, to, to sacrifice unto Yahweh thy Elohim. And the rest he gave, and the rest he have utterly destroyed. So we destroy everything else, but we save the best of the sheep. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like that scene in Baby Boy when he was at the door and he said, he said, I tell them H is the truth, but I lie to you because I love you. See, I love you, so I'm going to lie to you because I don't want to hurt you. But I tell them the truth because I don't care how they feel. Right. And that sounds logical in your mind. That sounds logical. Yeah, you beat people that you love. There you go. There you go. And people who get beat will say, in some of their minds, not all of them, that a man don't love you if he don't hit you. A man don't love you. A man don't love me if he don't hit me. Really? You feel that low about yourself? That in order for you to be shown love, you okay being an everlasting punching bag? So anyway, Saul says he did what he did. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what Yahweh has said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, when thou was little in thine own sight, was thou made not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And Yahweh anointed thee king over Israel. But that line is saying, in your sight, you were considered minuscule to yourself. But Yahweh saw greatness in you. And because Yahweh saw greatness in you, I am going to make you. Prior to this, Saul was righteous. Let's attribute that to us. Yahweh sees greatness in every one of us. Hence, why he chose us to serve him. But we carry ourselves as though we're nothing. We look in the mirror. When, we, when you look in the mirror, what do you see? Do you see I'm a daughter of the Almighty? I'm a son of the Most High? Or do you say, hey, I just see a nigga? I just see a whore. I see a whore mongrel. I see a drug dealer. I see. I see what the see the world is telling me that I'm no more than that. I, I'm meant to just be pregnant. The world is telling me, son, you're meant to walk around here with your pants hanging down, fall into homosexuality, fall into alcoholism, fall into uh, into drugs. But Yahweh said, the reason that I chose you, Saul. See, in your sight, you were small. But in my sight, I see greatness in you. And all you niggas can do is fight each other. I see greatness in my daughters, and you men deal treacherously with them. I see greatness in my sons. And y'all don't want to make it work. I didn't choose you because you were great in numbers. I chose you, Israel, because I love you. I see something in you that you don't see in yourself. You walk around here. You can't say nothing to Israel because you get offended every five freaking minutes. It's sickening. It really is. But I see this greatness in you. Get the nigga out of you. You are a king. You are a queen. You are my son and you are my daughter. Get it, get it together, Israel. Saul said, Samuel said, man, the Almighty came to me. You were small in your own sight, but I saw greatness in you. The world telling you, you ain't nothing. The world will tell you in a minute, you ain't nothing. 
The husband telling the wife, you ain't nothing. The husband telling the wife, you ain't. The wife telling the husband, you ain't nothing. If you Israel and you making someone that's Israel feel this small, oh, Yahweh sees it. I don't care how many times you want to walk around here wearing the binders and, the, and all this commandments on your chest. Walk around here with friends just dragging the ground and locks. If you ain't treating his children right, you ain't got nothing coming. Don't confuse blessings with mercy. Thinking that, yeah, I'm, I'm doing everything right. Treating the one that you with like they this. Whether it's your wife, your husband, your children. Yahweh said, what you don't see, I see. I made you. You don't think I know you. You don't think I created you. I made you beautiful. I made you great. He said, man, Saul, when you were little in your own sight, in your own sight, I anointed you to be a king over a nation of people. I did. So y'all willing, I'm going to finish this lesson up. Um, I let time get past me. I'm going to finish this up. I know there are some questions. Oh, I hate leaving questions out there. Um, I'm going to read this poem, Praise Yahweh. And then... Um, how many how many questions are there? Two questions. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. For those who ask questions, I apologize. I got up here kind of late. Um, uh, and I went really late. So y'all willing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on that. But hold on to your questions. Y'all willing till next week. They'll be there, so I'll know. So hold on to your questions. Um, and I'm going to get to your questions. I apologize because our time kind of ran over each other. But I want to read this poem. Praise Yahweh. Healed by his promise, no longer lost, found by his grace. The light of his mercy shine bright upon my broken soul. I am his son, so I should shine like one. Praise Yah. The reason that I'm saying what I'm saying is because my wife and I had a conversation. Since Israel is so dang gone sensitive, it's, it's ridiculous. Can't have a conversation, can't have a disagreement without somebody being angry and not wanting to call you no more, not wanting to speak to each other no more, not wanting to be around nobody. Let's stop that, please, please, please. Let me tell you something. Yahweh put greatness in all of us. We are beautifully made because we look like our father. When we go home and look in the mirror, this isn't being arrogant. When we go home and we look in that mirror, if you don't see greatness, that's a problem. Because how can we say we look like Yahweh and not see greatness? And I'm not coming at it in an arrogant sense, like, yeah, I'm this, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm big bad Bob. No. I'm coming at it because let me tell you. When you think highly of yourself, you're going to hold yourself to higher standards. There won't be no more that I just go through life just existing. Yahweh has a purpose for everyone that's watching and that's in this room. What that purpose is, is individualized with the Almighty's dealing with that person. But for those who did listen, and y'all willing hold your questions, um, and y'all willing bring them in for next, bring them next week, please. And I appreciate you. I'm sorry I didn't get to everybody, but um, 
yeah, we're gonna we're gonna uh, pick this up, y'all willing next week, and um, yeah, we're gonna do that. Uh, are there any comments, questions, jokes? All right, all right, I got a joke. I with that place. Praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. But um, okay, let's face the east and let's pray out. Shema Israel Yah Eloheinu Eloheinu Yah Ka Hero Israel Yah Elohim Yahweh is one Yahweh bless you Yahweh please bless us and keep us Yah please allow your face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us Yah please lift up your countenance upon us and give us peace Yah thank you Yah bless you Amen All right so Y'all willing next week, bring all questions, no matter what the question is. Well, I need to preface that. I know more rage. I want to also say this too. To, um, as we spoke earlier, send the prayer out to Minister Yoel and his family, um, his beautiful family. Um, we did lose a great teacher. Um, but his legacy is going to live on through his teachings. And um, it was an honor to teach beside him. Um, that's true. And I used to be like, man, yo, man, he's so rough. He just be willing to be rough on us. But when you sit back and when I had time to think, even before now, today, I thought about it. He was just making me a better teacher. And I didn't get the chance to thank him. So take your chances while you have them. Thank the people you thank. Love the people you love. And when you look in the mirror tonight, starting tonight, see Yahweh because he's in you. You don't see Yahweh? Pray for him to reveal himself to you. I say that. And for all comments and questions, pre please, y'all willing, bring them, y'all willing, next week. And uh, y'all willing, I'll address all the questions. That'll be the opening part of the course. I'll answer questions. Uh, and I'll pull them off the offline, too, so I can see the questions. And um, y'all willing, I'll answer them. But I appreciate everyone that's listening, um, everyone that's shown the House of Yehuda support. Thank you so much for that. And um, with that being said, y'all loves you. Keep being great. Keep walking with Yahweh. Bless y'all. I mean. I meant to mention this. Is, are we still on? Good. I wanted to mention this too, real quick. You can type in stuff, sis. Thank you for working that for me too. I appreciate you. But you know what's funny? Not how funny, but really deep is we apologize to Yahweh and then we expect everything to be okay. We per what do you mean, brother? We purposely do things wrong and then say, Yahweh, I'm sorry. And then we have the audacity to walk away smiling like I apologize. But like you brought out earlier, sis, if you offend me and you say you sorry and it was an offense that really broke me, I would be like, man, whatever. Get out of my face. But what we do is when we offend each other, we expect each other to get over it. Get over it. But when we offend Yahweh, we expect the same of him. Yeah, Yahweh, I know I offended you and broke one of your laws, but Yahweh, get over it. I, I, I said I was sorry. It's sorry enough. We'll discuss that. It's sorry enough. 
I remember Minister Dan, a uh, great elder as well, talked about eggshells, walking on eggshells. Every morning y'all wakes us up, we should thank him because he doesn't have to. But um, he does. And think about that. When will the last sorry be enough for Yahweh to say, I'm done with you? Example, look at what he did to Saul. Saul was very sorrowful. Man, I sinned. I'm sorry. And what did Yahweh do? Did Yahweh say, okay, I'm going to give you another chance? Or did he say, I'm through with you? I'm finished. When Moses didn't sanctify the Almighty's name. And let's say Moses, Moses is nowhere, Saul is nowhere near can fit in Moses' shoes. But what happened? Moses tried to explain. Yahweh was like, uh-uh, uh-uh, you ain't going to go into the land. You didn't sanctify me. But here it is, we think that because we say sorry, we still in the good graces of the Most High Yahweh. Just something I have been meditating on, I wanted to share, but thank you. Appreciate your time. May y'all bless and keep us.